Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC308, our course on Revelation. And Daniel, thank you for joining the class. Let's pray together and then we will start. May I request somebody to please pray with the class and then we can start. Let's pray. Hey, Heavenly Father, I come to you under the name of Jesus. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the class uh, that we are about to have, Jesus. And God, I pray that you'll help us to open our mind and heart and listen to it and understand the spiritual truths. We thank you for your word, Jesus. What a blessing it is to read it, to understand it, and to know more about you. Be with us, Lord. Give us that understanding and wisdom as pastor teaches us. We thank you for Pastor Ashish. Thank you for all my classmates. Give us a good Wi-Fi connection throughout the session. May everything we do be here, uh, be done for your glory. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Okay, let's um, uh, pick up from where we paused um, last week. We were in... Uh, we're looking at the seven churches in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. We've gone through each one of these seven, I mean, not all of them, but we've gone through church by church, um, looking at uh, the message the Lord Jesus is directing towards each church, primarily the leader of the church, the messenger of those churches, um, through the Apostle John, uh, which he... Uh, then recorded and sent to them, uh, which we get to read today. And we're also using it as a benchmark for ourselves. Um, uh, we are trying to look at it and say, you know, this is the way the Lord Jesus looks at the local church. Um, this is the way he would evaluate and the message he would give to a pastor or a leader of a local church. And so, uh, many of us who are involved, uh, maybe we are leading, maybe we are serving, uh, and and so we, we want to take it to heart and say, okay, uh, I need to be careful. Uh, I need to uh, apply this in my own life uh, as a leader or even as a part of a local church and uh, see what I should be doing. Right? So we uh, were in uh, chapter 3 was the first the church in Sardis. Uh, we were looking at that uh, where, um, the, just to quickly review, the church in Sardis, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, where the Lord is um, speaking to this church, and he says, I know uh, uh, your works. You have a name that you're alive, but you are dead. So we mentioned last week, this is a very tragic place to be where the reputation is good, but before God, before the Lord, he says, you are dead. Right. So that means the on the earthly side, uh, everything seems great. You have a name that you're alive, but on the heavenly side, before the Lord, uh, it's not good. He says, you are actually dead. So that's a very dangerous place to be. And so we said, you know, uh, we, well, 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 it's okay to listen to what people say and all of that. But first and most important attention is, Lord Jesus, what are you saying about me and about the church that you've given me to lead? What are you saying? Am I leading right? Are we doing what's right? Uh, the problem with this church, uh, the church in Sardis, uh, he, he says in verse 2, your works are not perfect before God. So they've got things going. The problem is, uh, we could, to put it in simple language, they're not doing the things the Lord wants them to do. So that's one lesson. The second is, he says, verse 3, remember how you have received and heard, hold fast and repent. So the very foundational things, the things that they were given, they received and they heard, they seem to have drifted away from it. So he says, you know, remember, 
So that word remember is very important. Uh, you know, there are times we don't need to remember, we should not remember. Remember not the former things. Let go of the past. But there are times we should remember. Remember the things that you were given, you know, the truths that you were taught. Remember those foundational truths. Don't drift away from it. That's the second problem with this church. So we looked at the church, uh, the church in Sardis, and the promise the Lord gives if they will repent, if they will come back and hold on to um, uh, what's right before the Lord. Let's pick up. Now we're going to look at two more churches, and then we'll move forward. I, I need, uh, we need to pick up a little speed because uh, I want to make sure we finish things. Uh, I think we have, we'll have time till second or third week of April, and then we'll, we'll have to give time for an assessment and so on. So uh, we'll, we'll pick up speed. So. We're going to look at the next church, the church in Philadelphia. Revelation chapter 3, verses 3, sorry, 7 to 13, please. Somebody could read that for us. Chapter 3, verses 7 to 13. Anyone can read it? Revelation chapter 3, verses uh, 7 to 13. And to the angel of the church in the earth. Just to have a rest. 7 to 13. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right? These things says, He who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I'll make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie indeed, I'll make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Thank you. All right. So the church in Philadelphia. And I'll look at how the Lord Jesus introduces himself. He's, he's pointing to aspects of his character. Holy, true. That means the one who is perfect one who is totally true, righteous, integrity, one who is true, who has the authority, the key of David. He's talking about David's throne, David, you know, the, so for them, the Jewish, David was the greatest king because he's the one who subdued all their enemies. Saul was the first king, but he was the greatest. He came in, subdued all the enemies, established the people in the land. The key, the authority of David, talking about his kingship. So he's holy, he's true, he's king, he's sovereign. And this king, when he opens, nobody can shut it. When he shuts, nobody can open, meaning he is sovereign, he's, he's absolute. So this is who he's speaking, the one who has absolute authority, the one who is absolutely holy, the one who is absolutely righteous, is the one who's speaking to this church. Almost saying that, look, this is my standard. This is the standard that he wants us to, to live by, adhere to, operate in. 
the standard of holiness, truth, and authority. That's what he's called us to the operator. And so this sovereign Lord, King and true, holy and true, so, you know, he's speaking to the church. He says, look, I know your works. So we mentioned last week you know, to every church, first sentence, I know your works. I mean, he's looking at what we are doing. Uh, not, I mean, yeah, what we say is important, but he's looking, what are you doing? What, what, what's translating into your daily life? What's your daily life like? Well, I know your works. And then he says, look, I'm sitting before you an open door. Nobody can shut it. So this holy, true, sovereign king, he's saying, well, I'm sitting before you an open door. So there is supernatural advancement, supernatural uh, open door that he is setting for the church, for them to move. So open door means I'm giving you access, I'm giving you advancement. Nobody can stop that. And the same sovereign king is saying, the people of the synagogue of Satan, those Jews, I'm going to make them come and bow before you. So the Lord is extending his authority for and through this church. And, and and this made us think, you know, we, I think, uh, maybe two weeks back, I'm not sure when we had this discussion, you know, why is there this difference between the church in Smyrna, for example, and the church in Philadelphia? Or why is the Lord, you know, uh, relating to this church in Philadelphia with, in this manner? Because he loves every church. They are all the churches belong to him. He loves every soul. Uh, he loves everyone. But this church is is in in you know in a, in a place that what we would say we would all love to be there. We would all love to be like this church in Philadelphia, because there's nothing to rebuke, nothing to you know call them back to repent. But instead, the one who is holy, true, and sovereign is extending that in and through the church i'm going to give you an open door nobody can st stop you you nobody can stop you you will be advancing and you'll be in a place of dominion authority the synagogue of satan will come and bow before you definitely we would love to be that church so uh, that's something i want to really think about and say god we want to be like that like this church you know of course no church is perfect. Uh, we see that, you know, Ephesus, Smyrna, uh, Pergamos, and Titan, and Sardis, and we'll also see Laodicea that, you know, like all these churches are having their own problems, things that, but eventually we work through our problems. We, you know, you, you know, you, we are all in a stage of growth and uh, maturity, and God is dealing with us, but we, we should come to this place of being like the church in Philadelphia, that the holiness, the, the character of the Lord, the holiness, the truth, and the sovereign, sovereignty of the Lord, the sovereign Lord is extending that through us. And this church is in a place where he says, you're invincible. I will set before you an open door, nobody can shut it. And you're in a place of dominion. You're opposers the synagogues of satan they're going to come and bow at your feet and they're going to acknowledge that i have loved you so what we should strive for is god help us to get our ourselves and our congregation uh, to that place but what's the key he, he points out some things here he says you have kept my word. So they're a little strength. I mean, yeah, they were not like, you know, uh, they, they started small. They had little strength. But what did they do? You kept my word. Yeah, verse 8. You kept my word. You've not denied my name. You kept my word. 
must stay held on to the word. They lived by the word. Whatever was given to them. Remember, you know, they don't they didn't have a Bible like you and me. So we could always go back and read the scriptures and so on. But the word that was brought to them, that was ministered to them. So you kept my word. You held on to that. You kept it kept held on fast to my word. You kept my word. And you didn't deny my name. You were faithful to me. Faithful to me. Right? He says that one, one, once again in verse 10, you kept my command to persevere. You kept my command to persevere. So uh, the, this was the, the church in Philadelphia. They held on to the word of God. They did not deny the name of Jesus. And they just persevered, persevered. That means they must have gone through their hard times. It's not recorded for us here. But they persevered through their hard times. So three things we learn here. We must stay true to the word of God. Stay true to the name of Jesus. And journey through whatever we have to journey through. Stay, stay, with, stay the course. We're going to come into this place. Of being invincible, we can advance under this place of authority and dominion where opposers will come and bow before our feet and acknowledge that the Lord has loved us. And then he also says, he says, I will keep you from the trial, the auto trial, verse 10, which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So, what would that mean? Uh, he said, I will keep you from the hour of trial. It's going to come on the whole world. So, the trial that would come on the whole world is what we see unfolding in the book of Revelation. Right? Of course, there, there, there would have been smaller localized tribulations and challenges. But he's talking, verse 10, about the trial that would come upon the whole world. To test those who dwell on the earth. I mean, it's something that's global, and what Revelation unfolds is something that's global that's going to that affects everyone. So, verse ten is again another indication for us that the church, while there is an immediate local understanding of what verse ten for the church in Philadelphia, there is this also this understanding of the long term, longer term fulfillment of the church being preserved from all the tribulation that will come upon the whole earth and the whole world, the church will be kept from that trial. So Revelation 3.10 is understood both ways, both in terms of a localized, but also in terms of a, a for the church uh, being pr pr protected from the time of tribulation. And then he promises them uh, the reward of uh, uh, overcoming. You, know, you hold on to your crown, you'll make you a temple, a pillar in the temple of my God, I'll write my, the name of my God on you, the, so that that's, that's God's going to call us by a new name, a new identity, talking about who we are going to be in the coming kingdom, right, which will be then revealed to us. So, Philadelphia, Church of Philadelphia, is something we must strive to be, that we must strive for our local congregations to come into that place, the key is, Stay, hold on to the word, stay true to the name of Jesus, persevere through whatever you have to go through, persevere through it. They're coming into a place of authority and dominion and supernatural advancement because the Lord whom we serve is holy, true, and sovereign. That's whom we serve. Any thoughts, any questions before we move forward? Okay. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. All right, let's move to the last one. The church in Laodicea is kind of a sad state, sad state. And it's something we also have to be very watchful about, very watchful about the church in Laodicea. Let's read that. 
chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, uh, verses 14 to 22, please. Somebody could read it for us. And to the angel of the church of Laodiceans, write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the mm. beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, I have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched miserable poor blind and naked i counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see as many as i love i rebuke and chasten Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Who, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Thank you. Thank you. So, five out of the seven churches receive a strong rebuke. And perhaps what the Lord Jesus is telling the church in Laodicea is probably the, maybe the strongest rebuke. So he introduces himself as the Amen, the final, the final word, the so be it to everything. He's faithful, he's true, and the beginning of the creation of God. So we need to comment on that. The beginning of the creation of God. So sometimes people use this to say, look, Jesus said, he is the beginning of the creation of God. That means he was created by God. Now, you don't, don't understand or interpret that statement that in that sense. When he says the beginning of the creation of God, you understand it as he is the origin. Out of him came all the creation of God. The source of the creation of God. Okay? Not in the other sense that he was the first person to be created by God. No. He is the source, the beginning, the origin, the source of all of the creation of God, which the Bible, it's consistent, collusions, you know. All things were created by him, for him, through him, and they are held together in him. Right? Colossians 1, 18, 19. So that, that phrase, if it is Sometimes, and like you know, you could say the Jehovah's Witnesses would be very keen to take that phrase and, and say, Look, 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 he's created by God. No, he's not created by God. He's the origin, the source, the one through whom everything was created. That's where it came from the beginning of the creation of God, the source of the creation of God. So, this one, the one who is the Amen, who's faithful, he's a true, and the one who's a creator of all things. Everything comes from him. Everything flows through him. He's speaking to this church. It's almost like there's a sense of disappointment, maybe a sense of, and I'm, I'm, I use the word, I'm using the English word, disgust, you know, like, I'm just, in, in the words that Jesus is saying, he's saying, I wish you were hot or you were cold. I mean, you're, you're neither hot, you're neither cold. And so I can't even tolerate this, this lukewarmness. 
I cannot tolerate it. And it's like I'm going to vomit you, I'm going to spit you out. It's that sense of, uh, you know, disgust. That's a sad state for a church to be. They're lukewarm, somewhere in between. They're not like completely dead, but they're not alive. It's lukewarm, so. And the Lord says, I don't like that. I find that so, you know, the Lord, Lord is saying, and I, I can't tolerate it. I don't want anything to do with that kind of posture. So, while we must, uh, so here's the danger for us, right? While we want to be right there, you know, what we, what we would say, uh, we would use the word balanced or, uh, you know, finding the middle ground between uh, people going off on one side or people going off on the other side. We want to stay the middle of the road kind of thing, posture, which is a good thing. We must be careful that our desire to be balanced or to stay in the middle of the road does not lead us to a place of lukewarmness. So being balanced must not be confused or must not be misinterpreted or must not mislead us to being lukewarm. We should be red hot and balanced. Right? So that's a difficult place. I mean, it's a difficult place to be because generally sometimes when people are red hot, they're very jealous, they tend to go off on a tangent in something and they, you know, are way off on some particular idea or some particular teaching or so on. They tend to go off like that. So our challenge is I've got to be balanced. i got to stay in the middle of the road. i got to live this life in a very uh, balanced, quote-unquote, balanced way, but I shouldn't end up becoming lukewarm. Right? I need to be red hot. And I think that's the challenge for us. Like, I'm just trying to apply it for us as, as believers, you know. But what was the problem with this church, the church in Laodicea? If I want to put it in one word, I would say this church was self-deceived. Self-deception. They were self-deceived. So what do you mean? Because the Lord is saying, you think you are rich, in verse 17. Because you say... So he's, he's addressing the problem with this church, right? So you see, you're saying you are rich, you're wealthy, you got everything you need. But you don't know your true condition. Your true condition is you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So that's self-deception. They think they are something that they're actually not. They think they're in a place, but they're not actually in that place. So they think, hey, we've got everything. We are rich, we are wealthy, we don't have we don't need anything. So the question is, how could this, you know, how did this play out? And how, how could this play out for us today in our day and time? How could a church, starting with the leadership, of course, come into this place where they think they're wealthy, they're rich, they have everything they need, but actually Jesus is saying, hey, your true state is, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked, you're miserable, you're wretched. I mean, you're in a very bad state. How could this, sorry, how could this play out uh, in, 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 in today's context? Any thoughts anybody wants to share? I hope you understood my question. How could a church be self-deceived? like this, where they think they are rich, wealthy, and they got everything they, they need, but actually their true state is they are poor, wretched, blind, naked, um, miserable, wretched. How could that happen? Please go ahead, call it. 
I think pasta, it's all about uh, in the two, can I call them worldviews? One is spiritual, another one is, is worldview, whereby people might look at their physical wealth and uh, maybe their physical status, like uh, maybe they have a big parking yard, Maybe when, when the pastor brings up an idea, like they are making an extension or building a hotel for the church, for the visitors, when they see that the offertory gets full, they say, wow, we've, we've hit the jackpot. But when actually mm. spiritually, they're just as the Christ says in the church about Laodicea, that they are, see, they are, they are naked, they are empty. They are, when they are not holding a lot, when it comes to the spiritual realm, when they are no longer preaching mm. the word, when they are no longer, when they get their own ideas into the Bible, yet it should be the Bible to interpret their own ideas. Let me put a, a full stop at that, Pastor. Mm. Thank you. Mm. This is true. This is true. Right? So this is uh, exactly how it plays out or could play out in many churches. True. Debia, your thoughts, please. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, I was thinking about the two extremes of cold and hot. Um, so, cold in the sense, I uh, uh, what I have observed is uh, sometimes biblical principles would be applied uh, to secular institutions and things like that and it could be successful and uh when when it is applied to secular institutions and they get successful uh the churches or christian organizations they uh, sometimes have an inclination to uh adulterate get adulterated with those things because uh, when the secular world applies it, it gets very secular. Uh, for example, uh, what to say? Uh, yeah, servant leadership or something like that. I see the concept of servant leadership being used in corporations, big, big corporates. It's a biblical principle uh, which uh, is being adopted but uh, the glory is never given to god right in a in a secular institution and uh, what happens with that is uh, the world sees no difference between the church or uh, the uh, no difference between the church and the world it's like uh, the secular institutions are also as good as the Christian institution. So it's 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 just like it becomes like the principles are, are being applied, but never the glory is given to God. That's that's kind of one way where church can take advantage of it. Actually, churches could take advantage of in the sense teaching, you know, getting into these uh, areas um like institutions secular institutions and such things where church could influence and uh you know give glory to god but i feel like the influence goes the other way around uh yeah, uh, yeah the secular world comes and influences the church the mm. focus focus shifts uh whereas uh the heart i i feel i was just uh thinking of what you you were pointing out like focusing on certain aspects and getting way off the tangent. Um, for example, there are people who, uh, you know, uh, think that Jewish feasts and uh, all those um, need to be revived or it's exactly like what the church, uh, the New Testament churches were experiencing with the Judaiz Judaizers, like, they they bring in this new uh, new uh, doctrine of okay maybe we need to uh, observe all these fees and uh, all these uh, uh, you know rituals uh, like mm. so 
then uh, the emphasis, you know, the focus, it, all these are good things and they indicate something biblical. But when the emphasis changes from what God intends and what his will is, uh, the tendency is to uh, just uh, lean way off from the Bible. It's, it just goes off from the... So I've heard someone quoting, like, if we give em emphasis on one uh, particular aspect of Christianity, there is a chance of us getting way distracted, like only one aspect if mm. we put emphasis on. So, uh, uh, so I feel that churches are struggling to strike that balance between mm. this, this, these two. Mm, mm. Maybe there are other other areas as well, but th these are some things I can, I could think of. Um, uh, yeah, if if for example, if grace of God is given more emphasis, uh, then people forget about the, you know, the righteous God that He is. Mm -hmm. So the balance, uh, there is a balance that needs to be given, and when that balance is taken off. Uh, yeah, you, even the you know theology can get a, bit, a little way off. I mean, mm. yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Sorry okay. if it's a long time. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so I think Libya is talking about how institution or just general and secular institutions can actually come into the church that makes the church cold. Uh, and she was just trying to describe the whole process of when we actually trying to go out, but they end up coming in, and the church becomes, you know, uh, the, uh, as as they would say in old times, the world comes into the church, that makes the church cold, or they go swing off the other direction. Yeah. Uh, anyone else wants to share any thoughts? Yeah. How could a church end up in a place? being self-deceit, where they think they have everything, they're wealthy, they're rich, but actually, in the sight of what the Lord is saying is, you are wretched, poor, miserable, blind, naked, you know. So how could a church end up like that? And therefore, they end up becoming lukewarm, and Jesus says, I don't want anything to do with that kind of posture. So, uh, you know, and, and Collins also shared earlier, uh, where, and I think what, what Collins shared is something so common, where sometimes, just because we have everything, we tend to equate that to our spiritual condition. That is a problem. We shouldn't do that. We should not equate what's happening in the natural. I mean, yeah, you've got a nice this, you've got nice that, you've got this, you've got money, you've got this. That is not always a reflection of our true spiritual condition. And I thank God for all these things, you know, thank God for his blessings. Thank God if a church is prospering, a church has money. If a church is, you know, has lots of funds, uh, thank God for that. Those are the, you know, thank God for it. But we have to be very honest when we examine our spiritual condition. So, God, what is my real spiritual condition? Where am I really? We have to evaluate ourselves by the plumb line of God. So, by the standards God has set, right? Simple things. Loving God. Worshipping Him, loving His Word, walking in truth, in integrity, in character. These are simple things. He's told us so many times. And that's what we have to evaluate ourselves. We can't evaluate by how much money I have, how big a building. Uh, the blessings are good, but they don't give us a true representation of our spiritual, where we are spiritually, right? So, and if you get that confused, we end up like this. We become lukewarm. But anyway, what's the solution? 
what is the Lord telling this church? Okay, he says, look, this is your condition. You are in that place, but here's a solution. What's the solution? Verse 18. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold, white garments, and anointing for your eyes. So he says, look, church, I want you to do something. I want you to buy from me gold, white garments, anointing. Buy from me. Now, think about that phrase. The Lord is telling the church, buy from me. Give me money. Buy from me. What does that mean? So here's a very interesting thing. Everything God gives is free. Everything God gives is by grace. Everything God gives is because of the cross of Jesus. But for us to receive, we pay a price. So when the Lord is saying, buy from me, he is literally saying, I want you to pay the price. To receive you pay the price buy from me it's not like i'm sending god some money that's not his that's not what he's saying buy from me it's meaning you pay the price for what gold refined in the fire it means like real gold which this god who is the amen who's the faithful who's the true one who's the creator of all things this one, he's going to offer you pure gold. He's going to offer you white garments. And he's going to offer you real anointing. But you pay the price. So what does gold represent? Gold represents whatever is divine. So in the Bible, you understand, gold represents what's divine, meaning what really comes from God, the true riches. That comes from God. So he's saying, you pay the price for gold refined with fire, for whatever is the true riches, the things that come from God. Those are the true riches. You pay the price for it. White garments, it's the righteousness that comes from God. That's our true covering. You pay the price for it. So on the one hand, righteousness is a free gift. It's a gift of grace. We receive by grace. But there's a price I pay, you pay, and we as believers pay to receive what God has freely given to us. Right? The true, whatever is divine, what comes from God, the righteousness, the white garments he gives, and the anointing he gives. This anointing brings revelation. He says, anoint your eyes with eye salt that you may see. So this anointing is going to give me the revelation. These white garments are going to be my true clothing, covering the nakedness of shame. This true gold is what's going to make us really rich. So what's the key? The key is pay the price. Pay the price what's really valuable, what's eternal, what's really divine, the true riches. Pay the price for walking in righteousness before God. Pay the price for the anointing that comes from God. So that's what he's calling the church to. Buy from me. You pay the price for this. On the other side, it's been provided freely by grace, available through faith. For us to receive, we've got to be willing to pay the price. So, how does this translate to everyday life? God may have blessed us. 
Okay, just take think about this scenario where God has blessed the church. Maybe you have all the money you need. You may have all the buildings you need. You have everything, whatever. You know, so that that, that could make us think, oh, I am wealthy. I am rich. I have everything I need. God's blessed. Wonderful. But in the midst of the blessings of God, you're still paying the price. Seeking God for what is true, the true riches that come from God. So God, you know, all these things, they're earthly, they're temporal. Okay, God has given us, given that to do some work. But I'm pursuing the true riches that come from God. I'm pursuing intimacy with God. I'm pursuing the truth of God. I'm pursuing worship of God. I'm pursuing into you know a uh, 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 genuine walk with God. True riches, gold refined with fire. What's eternal? Pursuing righteousness before God. I received the gift of righteousness. Those white garments, but I got to walk in it. And I'm pursuing the anointing that comes from God. God gives it freely, but I, in order for me to receive, there's a price to pay. So really, in the midst of all that, we're continuing to pray. We continue to seek God. We continue to pay the price of the, the disciplined life of prayer and seeking God. And he says, that's what, that's the posture we should be in. And when we're in that posture, then our spiritual condition is taken care of. We have what is true gold, white garments, the anointing we need. So even though there may be all these things God has blessed us with, this is our posture. We are buying from God. We are paying the price. Right? And well, just a few things here. He says, I'm standing at the door and knocking. So it's an, again, a very sad picture because it's like Jesus is outside the church. Thanks so for having church. Hey, you left me outside. So you're all gathering together. He promised for two or three gathered together in my name. I'm there. But the sad part is because these people are like this. He's outside. I want to come in. I want to come into this place of fellowship with you. I want to come into this place of intimacy with you. So let me in. I want to change everything. Right? And then he says, if you overcome, look, I'm going to let you sit with me. This one is the beginning of all creation. Who's the faithful, true and faithful witness? You'll sit with me. Meaning I'll put you in this place of dominion. Put you in this place of authority. That's the promise he gives. Right? So I think that's a key takeaway. The takeaway is, even if God has blessed us with everything, we should still be in a place where we are paying the price, buying from God the real thing. Right? These other things are temporary. Don't get caught up with it. That we shouldn't get self-deceived by those things. Okay, so let's pause here. I will go for a 10-minute break. We'll come back, and now we are going to move forward. We're going to get into the things Jesus said will come to pass. We'll, we'll meet at 11 in 10 minutes. Thank you.